May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You may know this phrase, but I had never heard it until last week. The wonderful phrase, you can't get off at the first bus stop of meaning. And so faced with a novel or complicated situation, or indeed faced with a classic familiar text like that first reading from Genesis chapter 1, you can't get off at the first bus stop of meaning, conveying that don't just stop at one meaning, declaring this is it, no more. You have to be aware of what became, came before and what may come after. And it's not right to declare either of those wrong. So I found it enormously helpful as I heard once again that familiar reading from the beginning of Genesis, the poetic, beautiful description of God creating. So, in years gone by, there was one bus stop of meaning that was very clear, which said that this story is about what God did in the first six days, and then God rested. And that meaning is clear and satisfying. I have here a copy of the children's Bible. And if you look at it and the pictures, oh, they go to town on it because the first day this, the second day this, it is a beautiful interpretation of the story and it works. And yet, some declare that that is the only meaning and in fact, if you push it to extreme, they will say true believers are the ones who believe in the seven days of creation, literally. And that, I think, is out of order. It is a very good bus stop. Read this, and it conveys something, especially if you haven't heard the story before, in a beautiful, clear way. But you have to allow the adventure of meaning to go on. And more than that, the extremists not only want to say it's the last bus stop, but also that it's the first one. And they don't realize how the story developed before they ever got to their understanding. So Genesis chapter 1 was composed when the people of Israel were in exile in Babylon, and they were living as a vulnerable people, living on the margins and they feared being overwhelmed by a foreign culture. And the driver for what we know as this lovely story in Genesis chapter 1 is that they wanted to say, this culture where we live is not right. Their picture of God is not right, and their picture of who we are in God's world is not right. So that culture had many gods. There were gods of sun, of moon, of dragons, of depths, of sacred bulls. And Israel said, no, there is one God. Yes, there's variety in creation, sun, moon, and dragons, and so on, but they all come from one God. And if nothing else, this story speaks about the unity of creation and the unity of God, and everything else is subordinate to God. But if the story is about unity, it's also about variety. And another thing that the people of Israel rebelled against was the foreign culture that said all power comes from the emperor. All authority, all law, all tradition flows from him. And we are mere nothing until we receive from the emperor. And they said no. Look at creation. Look at us. Look at what we're doing. There is enormous variety. And here was the wonderful insight, was that the abundant variety could be held together in good order. 
So the first bus stop of unity, the second of variety, but variety in a wonderful way held together in good order. Now there's much more that can come from Genesis chapter 1. But just for now, to note that what some extremists do say, actually the story only means seven days of creation and nothing else. But there is a verse in the chapter, wasn't read for us today, but you'll know it, that has been become particularly contentious recently. Some traditionalists, again, declaring it has one meaning and one meaning only. And they want to stop further exploration. And that verse comes at the end of the chapter. The key phrase in it is female and male. God made them. Ha! The traditionists say, there you have it. Humankind, there are females and there are males. No more, no less what we nowadays call a binary pair. And moreover, actually, if you look at the story, trees and flowers and animals, they're all in binary pairs. And even deeper, everything else created. Sun and moon, light and darkness, above and below, earth and water. Perhaps most poetically put, actually in the story of the flood, where into the ark things come two by two. And some traditions will say, there you are, that's God's purpose for creation, no more, no less. And I want to say, whoa, you can't get off at the first bus stop of meaning, or indeed any bus stop of meaning, allow things to develop. So recall, so far, what we've got is all comes from God, the unity, and all variety comes from God, and on any spectrum, both ends come from God and everything between. Because if this chapter asserts anything, it asserts that nothing has life except it has it from God. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you are, Life comes from God, both ends and everything in between. First day of creation, day, night. But what about those wonderful hours when the sun is setting? Or indeed those hours that I seldom see when the sun is rising? Where would we be without sunrise and sunset between day and night? Or the third day of creation, earth, oceans, dry, firm, wet, soggy. But what about marshlands and swamps and coasts and fens? Most of the birds in the world wouldn't exist if you didn't have that wonderful mess between the two extremes. Or the fifth day of creation, I don't know if you know this one, less well known. Great sea monsters are contrasted with every winged bird. Yeah, but what about penguins? They are winged, but they don't fly. They walk, but they swim. Where would zoos be without penguins? And so creation is far richer than binary pairs. Yes, the ends are made by God, as is everything in between. And that variety does not overwhelm the good order of God's creation. And so, I found it really helpful to hear that phrase, you can't get off at the first bus stop of meaning. There are familiar stories Genesis chapter 1, the parable of the sower. There are lots of familiar stories where, for you, you know what the story means and how it resonates for you, and that is good. And that remains valid even when others want to say, but I react to the story differently. 
And it's that variety that does not undermine good order. Creation is surprising, awesome, unexpected, more remarkable than we can ever imagine. And so too is God. God created female and male and everything in between. And at this stage, I feel like David Attenborough, breathless and exhausted by the wonders of creation. It's lovely to describe it. And the journey goes on.